Uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, today uh, Matthew Yankowitz from University of Washington. Uh, he's an expert in working in uh, two-dimensional materials. As you can see, is this a beautiful picture on the left. If you can stack these uh, up at different twists between them, you get uh, structures that are really not seen before in nature, at least so far as we know, that have a new electronic states, new properties, and really forms a fascinating system. Uh, that he's going to tell us about today. Um, uh, Matthew got his uh, PhD at the University of uh, Arizona uh, and has won a, a number of uh, prizes and awards. In 2020, he got a Young Investigator Program Award from the Army Research Office. 2021, the Lee Asheroff Richardson Science Prize from Oxford. Uh, 2021, an NSF Career Award. And most recently in 2022, uh, IUPOP uh, Young Scientist Prize in Low Temperature Physics. Um, so this looks to be a very uh, interesting talk. Uh, please go ahead. Thanks, and thank you to Lou Long for the invitation to be here and uh, for everyone joining. I really appreciate it. So uh, I'll be talking about more modification of prophetic thin films and you know, this work really starts out, if you follow in the field of more your, uh, your voice is breaking up uh, on. Uh, OK, let me try something. Is this better? Yeah, so far. OK, I think the animation is probably an issue. But I'm it's breaking up, it. yeah. OK. Um, is it better now? I think the animation might have been an issue. You're right. OK, all right. So we'll, we'll skip the first slide. But uh, you know, this talk will start in familiar territory of atomically thin sheets of twisted graphene, and then really push into new boundaries of asking, basically, what happens if I take this moray pattern and uh, make it coexist with a bulk three-dimensional like material? So, um, you know, the, the majority of the work that I'll be showing is unpublished. So hopefully, if you're familiar with this field, this, this will still maintain your interest. Um, so, you know, I think for this community, we don't need much background into the physics of twisted bilayer graphene. You know, suffice it to say that what's interesting about this material is that at the magic twist angle of about 1.1 degrees, the bands become very flat and Coulomb inter interactions dominate. And this leads to an emergence of uh, a variety of strongly correlated states and superconductivity and uh, other interesting phases. So we can take this building build block of twisted bilayer graphene and then assemble this into a much wider uh, family tree of, of graphitic moray materials. And so here's just a subset of those binned into the way that I like to think about it. So on the left here, we have this family of alternating twist graphene where we take this twisted graphene uh, building block and then start twisting additional monolayers back and forth. And the right side, we have much more exotic structures where we can have multiple moray patterns, multiple twist angles uh, with many layers of graphene. And in the middle, we have something intermediate where we have a twisted bilayer graphene building block, but then uh, we have uh, thicker graphitic uh, constituents. So like a bilayer, a trilayer, a tetralayer of graphene uh, that's with a monolayer stacked and twisted on top or some stack and twist of say bilayer and bilayer, bilayer and trilayer are more complicated. There's an additional degree of freedom here. You can choose to have a Brunel stacking or a rhombohedral stacking. Um, I'm, I'm gonna be focusing on the middle. I'll be focusing exclusively on the Brunel stacking configuration, both because it's easier to find those flakes and it's easier to maintain their stacking configuration when we actually assemble heterostructures. So what's been done before in this field, uh, this family of alternating twist graphene structures has been very recently studied. Um, by uh, a number of groups around the world now, um, some of which at MIT and Harvard. Uh, these exotic twisted graphene structures have largely only been explored theoretically and uh, not very, and minimally so at that. And in the middle here, we've done some work as a community on monolayer and bilayer uh, graphene and bilayer and bilayer graphene. The rest of this phase, split, phase space remains largely unexplored. So by way of comparison, I can ask what happens in this family of alternating twist magic angle graphene. Um, starting with twisted bilayer graphene, we know that we get these characteristic flat bands that host uh, correlated insulating states at quarter and half and three quarters and filling. 
And then superconductivity typically uh, slightly overdope from half filling of electron or hole bands. The twisted trilayer, tetralayer, pentalayer structures actually share a very similar flat band to what's found in twisted bilayer graphene. Now with some additional monolayer, bilayer, some combination uh, bands uh, coming along for the ride. And largely the physics of these systems is more similar to twisted bilayer graphene and more similar to each other than they are different. You know, in all of them, uh, we have some uh, symmetry broken states, uh, commensurate filling of the more and many bands and student activity typically found uh, just dope, when we dope just above half filling of either the valence or conduction band. And, uh, you know, so all of these share nearly identical flat bands due to their geometry. Um, that host correlated insulators and superconductivity. All of them require careful tuning of the twist angle to the magic angle to get this band to be very flat and so that we can expose its physics. So in contrast, these twisted M plus N layer structures where N is the number of graphene layers in the, the top and N is the number of graphene layers in the bottom. These also share commonalities amongst the systems that you know, we've studied so far. So both twisted monolayer bilayer and, and twisted double bilayer 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 graphene uh, share the fact that the bands can be deformed by displacement fields uh, much more profoundly than they can in the alternating twist magic angle graphene structures. So this relaxes the constraint that we need to hit a very specific twist angle. You know, if we if the bands aren't very flat at a specific twist angle, we can often flatten them by applying the right displacement field. But you know, graphene give it and graphene take it away for some reason. These systems don't manifest superconductivity, at least as far as we found yet. And it's not totally clear at this point uh, what's different beyond some arguments about the specific structures and symmetries of the bands. So what I'd like to focus on today is basically moving from what we know about the twisted uh, M plus N layer graphene structures and the atomically thin or the ultra thin limit and start pushing this into three dimensions where I'll argue that we can actually create new structures that I'll dub mixed dimensional moray materials. So uh, let's start with the familiar and to be just a bit pedagogical about this, I, I want to compare the origin of the flat bands and these different structures to see why uh, you know, we can get some commonalities amongst the twisted M plus N. So if we think about twisting two sheets of graphene, then we know that we have monolayer Dirac cones at the corners of the Brillouin zone in each. And those are offset in momentum space by the twist angle. We turn on the interlayer coupling and this creates uh, anti-crossing gaps uh, where the bands would, would overlap. And, and for some combination of the twist angle and the strength of this interlayer coupling, we can get very flat bands. And uh, you know, this is the origin of the magic angle in a hand-waving way. When we go to thicker structures, uh, we have additional tunability since applying a displacement field across a bilayer or thicker of graphene can, uh, can open a gap at the neutrality point. Um, but largely the origin of the flat bands is similar, right? So we have some offset uh, bilayer cones and momentum space, some twisted bilayer bilayer here. These are ties to create more and mini bands. And then we can open a gap additionally at neutrality by applying a perpendicular electric field or a displacement field uh, across the structure. And the difference is really driven by symmetry. So the, there are direct crossings in twisted bilayer graphene protected by the C2 symmetry. 180 degree rotation symmetry of the twisted bilayer graphene lattice. But this symmetry is broken in uh, these twisted M plus N structures. This allows us to gap the bands of neutrality with the displacement field. So this is the origin of this additional tunability in, uh, of these bands with displacement fields in these M plus N structures. So uh, uh, you know what we've done so far experimentally is to look at combinations of M and N where these numbers are no greater than uh, two, right? So we've looked at monolayer and bilayer, or bilayer and bilayer. And in each case, we're trying to hybridize materials, constituents that have just one low energy band. And following the argument I, I sketched out on the prior slide, we can understand why this can lead to an isolated and flat moray mini band. But now I wanna think about whether thicker uh, Bernal few layer structures can do the same thing. And the additional challenge here is that if I look at a trilayer, tetra layer, five layers, now we get additional bands uh, that also exist at low energy. And uh, you know, the question, which does not have an obvious answer, at least to me, is whether these bands now can all hybridize into things something that resembles a flat, isolated more and mini band, in which we can expect to see some sort of correlated physics emerging. 
So, uh, you know, we can just calculate this using the Bischritzer McDonald model. And it turns out that if you believe the tight binding model uh, band structure calculations, indeed a wide variety of these twisted n plus n graphene structures are expected to have, have very similar isolated flat bands. So here with the right displacement field, you can see the more a conduction band is both flat and, uh, and gapped from any of these other more bands. And so a question that arises is basically, why are these all so similar um, from, from band structure calculations? I'm not sure that I can offer a particularly profound explanation, but at least one way I like to think about this is by looking at the layer resolved density of states that these calculations predict. And uh, you know, if I look at different structures, monolayer, bilayer, monolayer, trilayer, monolayer, tetralayer, with the displacement field pointing from the monolayer to the thicker Brunel multilayer graphene, then it turns out that there's very common uh, uh, density of states arrangement where here I'm showing density of states with white as low and purple as high. You can see that the density of states is modulated by the Moray potential. And then there's a very large density of states on the Bernal sac bilayer um, next to the twisted interface. And as we add more additional sheets of graphene, uh, you know, the, the charge actually aggregates around this Moray interface and looks very similar across these structures. Uh, there's a question online, do the uh, band structure calculations include consideration of lattice relaxation? Yes, that's, that's included. So I'm, I'm happy to share the specific model that we use, but we do include that. Um, we can also look at the density of states arrangements for thicker structures, so including bilayers in both components are thicker. And uh, again, it's the same kind of picture. The density of states appears to like to localize around the moray and one additional uh, graphene sheet, depending on which way we point the displacement field. And then the remaining layers have relatively few states. So similar density of states distribution, and it's really aggregating at this moray interfa more interface. So uh, I suppose it stands to reason then that we might get similar moray bands out of these structures. Uh, so um, I'm gonna walk through now the basic transport phenomenology that we see in, in various uh, structures of different construction. And so I'll start with familiar territory, things that we've known for a couple of years now at least. Uh, so the simplest such twisted M plus N structure is monolayer bilayer graphene. All of our devices are encapsulated between flakes of boron nitride, and then they have top and bottom gates. And uh, the combination of the graphite gate voltage allows us to tune the carrier density and the twisted uh, graphene sheet in between. The difference between the gate voltages allows us to tune the electric field or the displacement field. So what we're really measuring is uh, transport uh, resistivity shown in the color scale as we sweep both of these gate voltages. But for convenience, I'm gonna skew the map to show what the relevant quantities we want to think about. Uh, carrier density or band filling factor on the horizontal and displacement field on the vertical. So uh, I'll note that the band filling factor, um, for those who may be unfamiliar, um, seems to have some features that are, uh, you know, move in, in, integer set, in multiples of four. And this four comes from the, the characteristic fourfold spin valley degeneracy of graphene. So one thing that we can notice immediately here is that transport is not symmetric as we switch the sign of the displacement field. And, uh, you know, this originates from the broken mirror symmetry of the twisted monolayer bilayer graphene lattice. Uh, we can also ask how well the single part particle band structure model does at capturing most of the transport that we see. So we can just calculate the density of states on similar axes. And we find that there's relative agreement. So if we look at neutrality, the density of states goes to zero when a gap opens um, at large displacement field. And indeed, we see insulating states at large displacement field. Um, there's similar structure of the full filling insulators at plus and minus four, four electrons or four holes per Moray unit cell. Uh, there are Van Hoek singularities that drift throughout the Moray conduction and bands, and we see you know, similar uh, features and resistivity uh, crossing through this map. And then we additionally see these insulating or resistive states that happen at uh, filling factors of one, two, and three in the Moray conduction band. And you know, because the particle model cannot explain why you would see an insulating state at partial band filling, uh, these states are attributed to the effects of correlations, to the effects of symmetry breaking. We can characterize symmetry breaking by similarly measuring the Hall effect. And the important thing here is really just a color, right? So uh, blue means electron-like transport, red means whole-like transport, white means uh, neutral. 
And so, you know, we can look at a place where we're neighboring a correlated state. In resistivity, we typically see a halo-like feature surrounding a correlated insulating state. And in the Hall effect, we'll see that the sign changes just when we traverse this into and out of this halo. So the way that we understand this is basically that at this point, our Fermi energy is just below a Van Ho singularity in the fourfold degenerate uh, MRA conduction band. At this point, uh, a symmetry of the system breaks. And now the chemical potential is just above a Van Ho singularity of a twofold degenerate uh, symmetry broken more a mini band. So this leads to a change in the sign of the of the precarriers. We can play our usual tricks to try to understand what the isospin polarization is of these states. So for instance, we can measure the gap of the correlated insulator at half filling a different inflame magnetic field. And we see that it grows roughly with a G factor of two. So that tells us that this is very likely a spin polarized state. I have, uh, you know, two spin up, spin down degenerate bands, and then additional degeneracy of these bands at K and K prime. And then when I put the chemical potential to exactly half filling of this band, uh, exchange favors polarizing all of the carriers into uh, one uh, spin polarization with presumably valley unpolarized. If I look at a different device, a different twist angle, uh, uh, like one electron per Murray unit cell, here we see that there is a very large anomalous Hall effect uh, that emerges. And this can be understood as polarizing into a single spin and valley uh, band. Uh, because these bands have a non-zero valley churn number, we have all the conditions that we need to realize a quantum anomalous Hall effect. Here it's not exactly quantized, but I think this can be pretty well understood owing to the consequences of disorder. And I should point out that, uh, you know, because spin orbit coupling in graphene is very weak, the magnetism underlying this anomalous Hall effect is uh, almost, almost certainly orbital in nature. So it's a kind of spontaneous uh, arrangement of circulating charges as they condense into a single valley. Uh, we can move on to twisted double bilayer graphene. So we can look two Bernal sheets twisted to just above one degree. Uh, now the transport is symmetric with displacement field because of the symmetry of the, of the structure itself. But we have a lot of the same physics, right? So we have these insulators at uh, neutrality and full filling that are displacement field tunable. We have these correlated states surrounding by halos. Uh, we can measure the Hall effect and we see sign changes around nu equals two. And now additionally around nu equals one and three, where we have uh, weaker um, symmetry broken states emerging. And so we can make a map where we basically infer the degeneracy of, uh, you know, the, the states in, within space in this diagram of doping and displacement field. Blue corresponds to symmetry and broken metallic states. Green corresponds to half metal states where a single degeneracy is broken, in this case likely spin. Uh, orange corresponds to where all degeneracies are broken. Um, in terms of double bilayer graphene, actually, it seems like this is not a spin valley polarized state. It, it's probably an intervalley coherent state that's been polarized, um, but I, I won't say more about that. Okay, so that's what's been known before, and now I'll move into kind of uh, the frontier of what my group has been working on over the past year. And to do this, I'm going to survey what we found in a handful of uh, thicker, but still nominally atomically thin uh, twisted M plus N graphene structures. So we'll twist either a monolayer or a bilayer on top of either a, a trilayer or a tetralayer, pronounce that correctly. So if I look at twisted monolayer, trilayer graphene, um, you know, to the seasoned eye, the, the transport actually looks very similar to what we find in twisted mono bilayer and twisted bilayer bilayer. Uh, we, you know, we have insulating states at neutrality and full band filling. And we have this halo surrounding a correlated insulating state at half filling, uh, and then weaker um, signs of symmetry breaking every quarter and three quarters filling. So in terms of the correlated phase diagram, actually, a lot is very similar to what we found previously. We can go to twisted bilayer, trilayer graphene, and it turns out that this is actually seemingly the most, uh, the most rich system phenomenologically. I don't know why. It's just kind of an empirical statement at this point. But if we look at a sample with a twist angle of about 1.4 degrees, we see that there's very strong symmetry breaking with the equals two and one and three in the conduction band. And also this additional halo in the balance band that has a, a, an associated sign change exactly at a filling factor of minus two. So this suggests that this is also a uh, weak symmetry broken half metal. So uh, this is you know, the first instance in twisted 
M plus N graphing, where we additionally see correlations in the balance band at zero field. And uh, there's some other oddities of, you know, of, of these structures. So we've seen anomalous Hall effect in U equals one, but in certain ways, this is a peculiar anomalous Hall effect. Um, I, I don't have enough uh, confidence to say exactly what's going on here. So I'll leave that to a to kind of future work. But there may be something somewhat strange about, about the topology of the system. Uh, magnetic fields can also do a lot to this system. So at small fields, so at zero field, you know, this is a phase diagram we see. We only see really one strong insulator. But as we turn up the magnetic field, um, all hell breaks loose, and we start to see the emergence of quite a few uh, new correlated insulating states. So between around one and four Tesla, we see very strong insulators emerge at uh, two and three and minus two. And then as we go up to 12 Tesla, we now start to see insulating states show up over a much wider uh, range of the of the um, doping and displacement field uh, parameter space. So um, this will be a bit fast, but I just want to show that you know you can you can really see some uh, very clean Landau fan diagrams in these devices that tell you something about the underlying symmetry breaking of these states. So as I take Landau fans at different displacement fields, I can see at what field uh, symmetries break owing to the formation of new Fermi surfaces that have their own associated sets of quantum oscillations. So this, this is probably going to be too much to, to really interpret all of this. At we want. Just look at the arrows point to where we get um, strong symmetry breaking. So at this displacement field, we see you know, symmetry breaking at one and two, and that's you know, what we see at low field. Um, as we lower the displacement field, now we see symmetry breaking at two and three, and these have their own sets of associated quantum oscillations. As we lower the displacement field further, where we don't see any symmetry breaking at zero field, you know, now we can see symmetry breaking states at one, two, and very weakly three uh, above some certain critical fields. Uh, if I lower the displacement field to zero, um, now I get a state that's very clear at half filling, maybe even something at a filling factor of six, so in the second Moray miniband. And finally, as I move to negative displacement field and look on the whole dope side, then you can see that there's a clear symmetry broken state at minus two that has its own set of quantum oscillations projecting to minus two at zero field. So all of these states that emerge in a magnetic field are likely valley polarized, although we haven't checked carefully. And to complete this picture, you know, I, I'll briefly show you what happens in twisted mono tetra layer and twisted bilayer tetra layer. Again, largely the physics of the single particle uh, features that we see at neutrality and full filling are similar. Now the parameter space with which we see insulating states shrinks more and more as additional moray bands um, start to you know, come closer to, to the lowest moray mini bands. Um, we don't see correlations, or maybe we see very clearly here, but uh, it's also not clear that we've hit the right twist angles. So you know, maybe future work might, might show that there's similar physics. But in essence, I don't expect any surprises here. I expect that if we do see correlated states, they'll probably end up looking pretty similar to what we found in the thinner structures. However surprising it is that they might exist in such uh, in graphing and twisting layers. So, uh, you know, I can press on and go to twisted monolayer on six layer graphene, and now things start to become different. So I still see these signatures of resistive states at plus and minus four. But if I look at this carefully uh, in the Hall effect map, I see that in these regions, it looks like the electric field is penetrating across this entire seven-layer graphitic structure, in that at least these features track tracked vertically. You know, they're, they're pinned to a, a given filling factor, and they can be tuned with displacement field. But in these regions, that's manifestly not the case. These features track only with a single gate. So it seems like this assumption that I've been making that the electric field is actually dropping uniformly across this entire multi-layer graphene structure is really no longer appropriate um, once I start to get to a thickness of around seven total layers. Um, so you know this this leads into uh, into a discussion of thicker structures, which is really kind of the meat of what I want to talk about, which is what happens happen if I uh, largely focus on twisting a monolayer of graphene onto a bulk sheet of Brunel uh, graphite. And as we'll see, uh, you know, this, this actually leads to something that's, I think, pretty interesting. Um, so, uh, you know, and because we're talking about graphite now, I just want to briefly detour and, and uh, talk about some of the basic properties of graphite without a moray. Um, so when we think about a three-dimensional thin film of graphite, 
you know, if I look at the Briwan zone, now I have to have a three-dimensional Briwan zone where um, the projection in Kx and Ky is still the usual hexagonal Briwan zone of, of graphene, but then it's extended in, in the Kz direction, uh, you know, owing to the stacking of these uh, graphene planes. And, uh, you know, when you calculate the band structure, what you see are kind of these additional parabolic-ish bands um, from being contributed from additional layers that kind of all coexist around small energy. And if I look at the, the neutrality point, uh, the touching point of these bands as a function of Kz, then we see at Kz equals zero or the K point, um, these bands are slightly below uh, the Fermi energy. So this is uh, a pocket of electron doping. And then uh, as we move to higher Kz at the zone edge, at H, um, this evolves into uh, a pocket of hole doping. So these, so these are these so-called like sausage link uh, Fermi surfaces of graphite where we have electrons around H and then holes around H. So, uh, you know, the important question then is if I'm going to make dual gated devices, what will actually happen as I try to apply an electric field across this structure? So this was calculated by uh, a number of people, but here I'll show Mikito Kishino's calculations over a decade ago. And what he's done is to calculate the band structure um, using some sort of self-consistency, such that when he applies uh, external potentials on the top and bottom layers, you know, the, the, the graphite has the capability of screening those electric fields since it's a metal. And so, so uh, if I look at the potential as a function of layer thickness um, n, then we see that the potential drops roughly uniformly across um, the few layer graphene labs up to around five uh, layers. And then as we start to get into more of like a bulk graphite limit of 10 layers or especially 20 layers, then the potential becomes very flat within the bulk, right? And this is what we would expect for a metal where it's going to screen electric fields in its bulk. So we can similarly look at this in terms of electron density. Um, so this is basically what telling us what's going to happen if we gate with top and bottom gates, like where are the electrons going to go? Um, for a few layer graphene, they just distribute themselves roughly evenly throughout all the layers. But for thick graphene, they form these accumulation layers near the surfaces. And largely the charge accumulates within the first three or so layers of uh, graphene on, you know, on either surface. Uh, so, you know, what we do then is to measure uh, transport in a dual gated uh, Bernal graphite device. Here we've chosen one that's 23 layers thick, but we've tested different thicknesses and we, we see pretty good agreement across all of them. Um, so this is, what, this is what the transport looks like. Resistance is a function of bottom gate and top gate uh, normalized by the dielectric thickness. It's kind of weird, uh, uh, you know, if I take cuts of uh, the resistance shown in black along, you know, sweeping one gate with the other gate grounded, there's this kind of like weird oscillatory behavior, um, but at least some things that make sense about this. If I turn on a small magnetic field and, and measure the Hall effect, I see that it has a single line change roughly around zero. And importantly, the transport is symmetric upon switching the sign of the gate voltage of both gates simultaneously. Right, so you know the graphite itself is symmetric, so it shouldn't matter, assuming that there's no difference in mobility of the top and bottom surface. It shouldn't matter if I sweep the top gate or the bottom gate. You know, I, should, I really should get the same thing. And indeed, that's what we see. Um, so I don't understand what this structure is, but you know, we've seen this across many devices. And so it's something intrinsic to graphite, um, but, uh, but it's a little bit weird. Um, but you know, things start to make more sense as we turn a magnetic field a little bit. So this is the evolution of the magneto transporting graphite uh, in steps of um, 100 millitesla. What we see is that this kind of weird uh, checkerboard-like behavior evolves into a diagonal resistance stripe that follows the line of overall neutrality in the system. And that comes concomitant with the sign change in the Hall effect. And the way that we've uh, tried to understand this is by modeling the system with a four-component true to transport model. So we're assuming that we have, you know, graphite is a nearly compensated um, semi-metal. So we have a, a nearly identical concentration of electrons and holes in the bulk. Um, I'm, it takes some value for what that is, although this model doesn't really strongly depend on that. Uh, you can also look back to literature from the 1950s to find what the bulk mobility is at cryogenic temperatures. It's around 10 to the 6. 
centimeters squared per volt second. And then you can assume that there's the same mobility on the surface. Although again, and this is really not modeled, uh, you know, parameter dependent. And calculate the transport in the magnetic field as you change uh, the doping on the top or the bottom surface. And uh, what we find is relatively good agreement between uh, this, this fairly simple model and what we see experimentally. So the key thing here is that this model is assuming that we can change the uh, properties of the surface accumulation layers, but that gating has no ability to change what's happening in the bulk. These bulk parameters are fixed, whereas the surface doping is allowed to vary. And uh, you know, so what I think this is saying is that uh, a small magnetic field is essentially exposing the condition of overall charge neutrality in this dual gated graphite. You know, if I were to turn off the gate voltages and just look at zero zero, then I would see that there's a very large magneto resistance. And this has been well understood from graphite, and, and indeed is true in many uh, compensated semimetals. What we see additionally by gating is essentially that this large magneto resistance persists even as we add more uh, charges to the system, as long as we keep it neutral overall. Okay, so with all of this in mind, I can move now to what happens when I take my graphite and then twist a sheet of graphene on top of it. And we'll use the same dual gated uh, device geometry, but now the gates are asymmetric, right? One gate faces the Moray interface, and I'll call that V Moray or AVM for short. And then the other gate faces the Bernal graphite interface, and so I'll call that V graphite or VG art. And so we can measure transport. This is a sample with a, uh, with a twist angle of 0.84 degrees and 10 layers of graphite. So it's one monolayer twisted on top of 10 layers of graphite. And immediately we can see that you know, the transport differs substantially now, depending on which gate we tune. So if I take my cut in you know, sweeping one gate with the other one grounded, uh, when I sweep the graphite gate with the moray gate grounded, we see kind of a single resistance bump more or less characteristic of graphite. And the single sign change in uh, the sign of the Hall effect, when I ground on the graphite gate and sweep the Moray gate, now I see a bunch of bumps in the resistance and I see a bunch of uh, associated sign changes in the Hall effect. So clearly something more complicated is happening uh, now that we've twisted a monolayer on top of this bulk sheet of graphite. So again, we can use this magnetic field effect uh, to expose what's happening, at least in terms of like the compensation condition of this sample. So as I turn up the magnetic field by steps of 50 millitesla, what you see is that the resistance starts to form this kind of like zigzag structure. And the Hall effect uh, has zero along uh, roughly the condition where the longitudinal resistance is a maximum. So this becomes especially clear at half a Tesla. You can see these very clear zigzag features in both uh, RXX and RXY. And if I, I'll tell you how we think we know the twist angle. We can, we can calibrate it in a couple of different ways. But if you just take, take me at my word that we know it, then we can recast uh, the gate voltage on the Moray into a filling factor of uh, what we might anticipate to be Moray bands. And you can see that these zigzags are key. Uh, in steps of filling factor of four, where again, the four comes from the four-fold degeneracy of graphene. So uh, we've taken to trying to understand this by calculating the band structure of graphite um, with the surface moray potential with the top layer twisted. So uh, if we don't include any gating, then this isn't particularly difficult, right? We can, we can just extend the bistrister mcdonald model to this larger structure. And uh, the additional thing that I'll show you is that we can color code these bands based on their expected projection uh, along the uh, C axis of this uh, graphitic structure. So here, plus one means that the state is entirely localized onto the top twisted monolayer. Minus one means that it's entirely localized onto the outermost Brunel layer. Zero means that it's in the middle. And uh, you know, to make it a little bit easier to see, I can saturate the color scale a bit just to highlight what's happening on surfaces. And we can see that, especially in red here, we have the formation of what really looks like moray mini bands in this twisted one plus 10 structure. And, uh, you know, this analogy becomes much more sharp if I just look at what happens and say twisted monolayer bilayer graphene. You know, this lowest red band looks almost identical to what's happening in the lowest low mini band of the twisted uh, monolayer bilayer graphene. 
So in essence, I think the simple way to understand the system is that you have still these more a surface states characteristic of the ultra thin twisted and placent structures, but now they simply have to coexist with uh, more and more log states from the you know, remaining graphite sheet as you add additional layers of graphene to the structure. Okay, so uh, you know, to model our experiment, we actually have to understand how these bands evolve as we apply gate voltages. And this is not an entirely trivial task. It took us a while to figure out how to do this correctly. Uh, because again, unlike the ultra thin limit, you can't just assume that the electric field will penetrate uniformly across the entire structure. You have to include some form of self-consistency uh, to, to accommodate the fact that the potential will drop uh, roughly exponentially at the surfaces. So we've calculated the band structure uh, as a function of uh, gating the uh, potential on the surfaces using a Thomas Fermi screening model. And this is what we find for a few select values of the potential. Um, so again, I'm going to saturate the color scale just to make it more easy to see what happens. So as I change the more a gate, as I either apply a positive voltage or a negative voltage or potential, what we see is that this red more a band will either shift up or down with respect to the chemical potential, which we're keeping fixed to zero. Right. So at zero potential, the, the Fermi level is roughly halfway between these bands. And then this band shifts up as I apply a positive potential on the top surface, or it shifts down as I apply a negative potential. And uh, you know, similarly, I can do a calculation for the graphite surface as I change the potential on the graphite gate. And now I want to, again, saturate the color scale and call your attention to the blue bands, which are the ones that live near this outer graphite surface. You can see that the red bands don't move as I change the graphite gate voltage. But as I apply a positive potential, you know, the, the valence band of the graphite gets pulled up with respect to the chemical potential. So I should start doping uh, poles. And as I apply a negative potential, uh, the conduction band moves down. So I should start populating electrons onto this outer graphite surface. So with this in hand, we can, uh, you know, use this uh, independent gating model to understand the field transport phenomenology in the system. So, uh, you know, as, as one more kind of way to conceptualize this, I can just integrate the various bands and plot the density states as a function of the Moray potential and separate them out for the two surfaces. So the red is basically the top three layers of the Moray surface, and the blue is the bottom three layers of the graphite surface. I, I, if you squint, you'll see that the graphite density of states doesn't move with respect to the chemical potential as I change the Moray's ray potential. But uh, the Moray bands form these kind of uh, bumps and dips in density of states. And if you just track what happens at the chemical potential, you know, starting at a positive Moray potential, we have a large density of states that evolves into a low density of states that evolves into a high density of states, back to a low density of states, and it keeps oscillating. So effectively, these uh, regions of low density of states are where we have band closures or gaps. Regions of high density of states are where we have Lipschitz transitions or Van Hove singularities at partial filling of each Moray mini band. And there's just some replicant structure as we sweep through the higher and higher Moray mini bands. Um, similarly, but perhaps more simply, when we tune the graphite gate voltage, you know, now the Moray mini bands uh, don't move, but the graphite band shifts across the chemical potential. And we expect to switch from electron to hole like doping. So I can basically model. Uh, this zigzag behavior by thinking of uh, each little region around um, around uh, you know uh, the neutrality of of a more a mini band as uh, kind of like a, a miniature phase diagram of graphite, right? So in this kind of schematic cartoon, if I just repeat this like magneto-resistant stripe along the line of overall overall neutrality in graphite. I just have to repeat that every uh, four integer filling factors, where I expect to start populating a new more a mini band. And similarly, I can model the sign change in RXY and this kind of exact structure in the same way. So that's what happens when I keep the graphite gate around zero and change the more a gate, and I sweep the doping in the more a mini bands. If we hold the potential in the more a fixed and then sweep the graphite, then we're either just dumping a lot of electrons or holes into the graphite surface. And eventually, we put more free carriers into the graphite surface than the, these like structured more a mini bands can possibly hold. And then uh, the sign of the Hall effect becomes low valued after that. You know, it's, it's just dominated by the charge uh, that we've put into the, into the graphite surface. 
Although we still see structure, you know, as we even even at high graphite doping, as we sweep through the through the moray minivans, we see resistance oscillations. So, <laughs> excuse me. So we can do this for different samples with different thickness and different twist angle, all around one degree. And we see that this kind of zigzag structure is actually relatively ubiquitous um, around the kind of crossover regime from the ultra thin to the bulk limit. It gets complicated, but you know you you still see these like reset type features around plus minus four uh, band filling factor. Um, I've shown you the one plus ten already. We can stack one layer on seventeen layers of graphite. Now at a larger twist angle, it doesn't matter. We see the same type of zigzag behavior. Things start to get more complicated as we go even thicker. You know the transport the 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 resistivity becomes the resistance becomes, becomes like washed out. Uh, and these oscillations in RXY become less clear. Uh, yet you can still see things that seem to track um, around, you know, factors of four or eight band filling. Um, we've independently confirmed the twist angle in some of these by uh, performing piezo response force microscopy prior to encapsulating the BN. So we, we do PFM on the monolayer sitting on the bulk. So we get an independent measure of what the twist angle was before encapsulating. And at least for these two samples, it's, it's very closely matched. So that, that gives us confidence that these oscillations are actually coming from uh, some moray. Now, uh, you know, I've talked about what happens at low field. I actually think the most interesting physics of this structure really is what's emerging in, in very high magnetic fields in the ultra quantum limit. And for that, I need to again, take a step back and talk about what's happening in graphite. And this type of physics was actually you know, recently elucidated uh, in this beautiful work by the Manchester group in 2019, where they argued basically that if you have some sort of electron trajectory that has an out of plane or a C axis component, when you turn on a magnetic field, this starts to form these cyclotron uh, spiral orbits. And uh, because we have a graphitic thin film, in some sort of semi classical approximation, I can think that this orbit will, will close in on itself and, and form a standing wave. You know, essentially, you can think of these as like particle in a box modes. So uh, what happens is essentially that the levels get discretized to all these particle in a box states. And the critical thing is that the two lowest lambda levels of graphite, there's a near degeneracy of these because they're effectively coming from Bernal bilayer uh, building blocks. Uh, these are continuous across the entire bulk of the material. This is really uh, physics coming from the fact that graphite is a semi-metal. Whereas all higher lambda levels in the ultra quantum limit are gapped in the bulk. So, uh, you know, what the, what the Manchester group did is to calculate um, using self consistent Hartree approximation how the charge will actually want to arrange itself as a function of the, the you know, layer number in the graphite on the horizontal and the lambda level index shown in the color for different values of a potential that's, ex that's applied externally. All right, so this is somewhat of a you know involved calculation to understand all at once, but let me just try to highlight the most important features. So if we don't apply an external potential and we're only populating at the lowest lambda levels, then what they find is that at high field, uh, you know, interactions favor forming this kind of standing wave effect, um, that or the density wave effect that's uh, equal and opposite for the two lowest lambda levels, such that if you integrate over both of these, you effectively still have a homogeneous charge distribution. But the wave function is extended all the way across the bulk. What this means is that as I start to apply a surface potential, I, uh, I do want to accrue root charges primarily at the nearest surface. But the, the lowest lambda level wave function is still extended all the way across this bulk. So it's naturally uh, going to impact what's happening on the remote surface as well. So in this sense, in the lowest lambda levels, uh, you know, we have equal response to both the top and bottom gate. Where, whereas filling higher lambda levels, uh, you know, we get purely uh, surface localized states uh, because these lambda levels are gapped in the bulk. So we can fill them on the surface, but then the bulk states are at a, are at a higher energy. We can't fill those. So those don't exist in the bulk. Um, there's a question, what B field is this calculated for? I think it's on the order of like 12 Tesla, but really it should work for anything in the ultra quantum limit around like seven and a half Tesla or above. And for thinner sheets, it can you can kind of push it down to lower fields as well. So uh, you know we can measure transport in graphite as a function of both the top and bottom gate. At two tesla, we see this like checkerboard sequence 
these are quantum oscillations of surface states that are tracking with a single gate. So they're either vertical or horizontal. These are only living at the surface. This is far below the ultra quantum limit. And then as I go past the ultra quantum limit to nine Tesla or above, then I start to see contrasting phenomenology where uh, in addition to this large like magneto resistance along the line of overall neutrality, I see quantum Hall states whose, uh, whose uh, constant filling factor is parallel to this line of overall neutrality, meaning that you know, normalized by the top and bottom gate capacitance, and it, it, it tracks along the it tracks along the line of the condition where uh, we're maintaining a fixed filling factor with the combination of the two gates. Then as we dove further, we get to this kind of checkerboard regime, and then we go back to uh, a diagonal regime as we dove even further still. So uh, you know, how can we understand this? Um, we can take Landau fan diagrams here sweeping one gate with another one grounded. There's a lot of complication here because we have kind of an intermingling of surface states and the bulk of ascended states. But if you take my word for it, basically all of these quantum oscillations project to zero. The same is not true when I apply uh, you know, a top gate voltage and then take the same Landau fan as I sweep the bottom gate. Now, if you look very closely, you see that there's actually two distinct sets of quantum oscillations. One that projects to just zero, shown in black, and then one that projects to the point of overall neutrality in blue. Um, so, you know, we can understand this by basically mashing together the map of the quantum oscillations as a function of both gates with a Landau fan diagram. So the idea here is basically that the bottom line is in the gate map is equivalent to the top line in this Landau fan diagram. And then I'm just going to ramp the field down. And what we see are that these uh, checkerboard regions, which I argue are related to the surface states coming from filling of the higher Landau levels, always project to zero. Whereas these diagonal states always correspond to the, the blue colored quantum oscillations that project to the overall neutrality. These are the, the bulk coupled states. So we can see both of them coexisting. And if we just map out how the projection portions of these, these uh, two fans move as a function of gate voltages, you know, it doesn't matter which gate we sweep, we just see in physics. We always have one set of quantum oscillations projecting to zero. Those are the surface localized states, these checkerboard regions. And then we have another one that checks a line of overall neutrality. Those are these diagonal regions or these blue states. Okay, so uh, you know the the final bit of this talk then is to understand what happens to this kind of standing wave physics as we apply a moray um, on one surface. So first, I'll show you what happens in this one plus ten layer structure where we sweep the back gate and and uh, you know take a Landau fan. So what we see is basically this is some non-zero moray gate. I, I didn't denote it, but what we see is something similar to what happens in Brunel graphite. You know, when we sweep the gate below the Bernal graphite face, we see these two sets of uh, quantum oscillations, one projecting to zero, one projecting to some value that's not zero. So these are surface localized states, these are bulk states. When we sweep the moray surface gate, uh, the, the gate facing the moray surface, then we see the additional sets of quantum oscillations projecting to finite gate voltage. You know, these are coming from uh, these new Fermi surfaces where we have the second and third Moray mini bands. And, uh, and, you know, so that indicates that this uh, gate above the Moray is able to fill these Moray surface states, whereas the gate below the graphite is not able to fill those Moray surface states. So again, we still more or less have this independent uh, tuning model, at least for the surfaces. Uh, but then what we can do is say, just look at these graphite gate fans um, I'll show you a movie as we change the Moray gate voltage. And I'm just going to highlight uh, two representative uh, quantum oscillations, one from the family of the surface states, one from the family of the bulk states. And um, you can watch what happens as we change the Moray gate. So I'm going to plot the projection of these on this map. So what you see now is that it's basically like graphite, where the blue states simply move along the diagonal. You know, now there's an oscillatory behavior of these blue states, and this oscillatory behavior almost exactly follows uh, this, you know, line of zero um, Hall resistance, especially within the lowest Moray miniband from four to minus four. And what tells us this is that the doping of the bulk states 
uh, oscillates governed by the structure of this surface moray band. So thinking about this in kind of a cartoonish way, right? This, this standing wave that forms in the bulk of the graphite will hybridize with the moray surface states, which now become Hofstadter states at high magnetic field. And this hybridization basically takes this two-dimensional moray, one that's localized to a two-dimensional interface, and imprints it on the entire bulk wave function of this entire three-dimensional graphitic thin film. So you're, you're really profoundly mixing the blue and the, and the red bands um, owing to this standing wave effect in the lowest line level. Uh, you know, so another interesting feature we see here is that even though the graphite gate is not able to uh, fill the moray mini bands, if your jet computers agree that we can still see brown zac oscillations at rational flux filling of the moray unit cell. And so this tells that these electrons on the graphite surface somehow know about the moray potential at high field. Uh, because, to, you know, the brown zac is a transport effect. It's effectively saying that at these rational flux fillings, the effective magnetic field is zero. You no longer have a Lorentz force that bends the electron trajectories, and so they move they move in a straight line again, and you get a, a, a maximum in the uh, magnetoconductance. Um, so, you know, my interpretation here is that the standing wave is effectively imprinting the moray potential onto the wave function of the bulk states. So we can't fill those bulk states directly with the gate below the graphite, but the electrons nevertheless still feel the effect of the moray potential, even though in principle the, the bulk should be screening it. We can play a similar game now, uh, you know, by looking at the function of the moray fan, the moray quantum oscillations, and, and these behave a little bit more simply. So, so not much action is happening when the green graphite gate is large, but then when the graphite gate is small, small uh, you see that these, the doping of these moray gate uh, fans will, will shift, you know, almost coincidentally with the way that the resistance looks um, at low field. So again, this says that, you know, the doping of the moray shifts only when the graphite voltage is small. So if I put too much charge onto the graphite surfaces, it seems like we're screening out with surface states the ability to modulate the doping of the moray surface states. Uh, we don't have a, a perfect model for what's going on here. Uh, but in any case, you know, this physics is rather generic to many different types of constructions of samples. So uh, in the kind of crossover regime between the ultra thin and the, and the bulk limit, uh, you know, we've done the similar mapping and we, we see basically similar physics. So this is why I would argue that this one plus six structure is more like bulk than it is like the ultra thin case. Um, although there's additional features that, that really do come from the ultra thin aspect of it, which, which really make this quite complicated. Uh, in the twisted one plus 17, we haven't mapped the moray fans, but I, you can imagine what will probably happen. But when we map the graphite gate fans, you know, we see a very, very good correspondence between the doping of the bulk graphite states and uh, at high field and the zero and the very small field behavior of the, you know, in, in transport. Um, so you know, we can you know, do one more check here and bury this moray interface exactly into the center of a flake of graphite. So in this sample, we've taken seven layers of graphite and stacked it on top of itself with a one, one and a quarter degree twist. Now the moray bands are simply no longer accessible, right? They're buried into the bulk and we can't fill those by gating with either gate. And now the gates to be symmetric again. But what we do see are very clear brown zac oscillations, uh, you know, almost exactly matching the end into a single for when we built the device. So what this says is basically that we're forming, you know, two independent standing waves that couple the top surface to the buried moray and separately the bottom surface to the buried moray. And these, these look very, very similar based on which gate we sweep. Okay, um, so let me just quickly uh, wrap up then. So what we've, what we've shown is that we can find similar band structures and uh, similarly resulting correlated and topological states arising across many ultra-thin constructions of twisted M plus N layer Bernal graphenes. And in the bulk limit, it seems that these moray bands <clears throat> simply become surface localized and coexist with the graphite states that are buried deeper into the bulk. Uh, the consequence of this is that the surface moray really transforms the properties of the entire bulk graphitic film in ways that I think are more profound than at least I first anticipated. So at, at zero and low magnetic field, the moray modifies transport owing to the dominant role of surface sort of accumulation layers in graphite. You know, so it's really coming from the fact that graphite is a semi-metal, but one that's very weakly doped in the bulk. So we can put almost as much charge or more on the surfaces than exists in the bulk. And, and we can really get where the transport is dominated by the surfaces. 
And then at high field, the moiré surface is directly hybridized with the bulk owing to this kind of standing wave effect in the lowest line level. And this effectively creates a single quasi 2D system that has this complex intermingling with remnant, remnant uh, surface states on the graphite. So, uh, you know, as a brief outlook, where can this go? Um, you know, one question that we can ask is can this bulk any wave couple multiple moiré patterns on the two outer graphite surfaces in new and interesting ways? We don't know yet, but we're, we're working on this. Um, another more general question is can this, can this similar physics be seen in other uh, nearly compensated layered bulk semi-metals? For instance, zirconium pentatelluride or tungsten ditelluride. These are likely much more difficult samples to make, but in practice, in principle, you know, I think a lot of the physics should be quite similar. Um, so with that, uh, you know, let me wrap up and acknowledge the people who did all this work in my group. Um, especially that this work was done as a collaboration between uh, postdoc Jason Waters and PhD student Ellis Thompson, um, with assistance from very talented master's student Esmeralda Argentinez, and more recently a, a new PhD student in my group, Ana Okanova. Um, the theory was done in collaboration with uh, Di Zhao and Ting Chao, and a uh, split done by Minato Fujimoto, who is currently at UW on an exchange um, from Mikito Kashino's group in Japan. Um, these were collaborators who worked on the early twisted mono bilayer and bilayer bilayer work. And uh, that's all I have. So thank you for your attention. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's fascinating. Really, a lot comes out of uh, uh, out of doing that. Let's see, for questions, please uh, type your question for the people in the audience in the Q&A or in chat, and then I'll look for those, uh, uh, you know, while uh, Matthew's talking. I guess I have a, a question to uh, start out with. Is it possible in, in this place where you're taking the graphene and then putting a a twist a graphite and then putting a twisted graphene layer on the, the surface. Can one come up with a simple model where you have a high mobility uh, metal with, with a low carrier density and don't worry about how that happens to say it's true. Uh, and then come up with a, a twisted bilayer at the top and, and come up with the sort of the undergraduate uh, version of uh, what you're talking about or. Yeah, so we try that first and um... It mostly works, but the problem is if you don't consider the hybridization of the twisted bilayer with the rest of the bulk, then okay. you end up with bands that look exactly like twisted bilayer graphene. And you know, twisted bilayer graphene has relatively special bands. Those like we th those we don't really want in this system because uh, you know I, I think that it's actually too special of a condition for us to be able to really understand what's going on here. But and kind of like a zeroth order first pass, what you're saying is exactly correct. You know, you can understand the majority of the physics probably by just thinking of an isolated twisted bilayer coupled to right. some like lightly doped semi-metal. If you really yeah. want to get the details right, then you need to consider the tunneling between those two. But you can you can turn that off in calculation, and what you get is not wildly wrong. Yeah. Okay. Um, questions. Oh, a question here, let me read that. Uh, this is from uh, Dave, David Goldhaber Gordon. Uh, for the near bulk case with the twisted monolayer, what is your strategy for getting a given twist angle? Question mark. And have you thoughts about why you don't get a SC? Super good. Yeah, I mean, so the strategy for fabricating the sample is exactly the same as for thinner structures. You know, we just find a bulk crystal of roughly the number of layers we want that has a monolayer that's attached to it. And then we use AFM cutting to isolate rectangles out of each of those portions of the sample and then just do the usual kind of stack and twist. Uh, it takes more effort to find these types of, these, these types of crystals are more special because you need to find like the right thickness of graphite with an attached monolayer so you know the crystalline orientation is the same. But, uh, you know, if you have committed uh, students and postdocs, then, then they'll do it. Um, that's on why you don't get superconductivity. Uh, I, I think that's, you know, that that goes. That's still a million dollar question. It goes back to the comparison I, I tried to make between the ubiquity of superconductivity in these alternating twist structures and its apparent absence and the twisted mono bilayer. I mean, ultimately, I don't know. Um, you know, one 
one simple argument that one could make if I just think about like, now I have a lot of statistics on many different types of structures and I can bend them into things that look this way and superconducting things that look that way and don't superconduct. You know, the ones that look this way all seem to have the C2 symmetry of their lattice and the things that don't superconduct all seem to have that broken. So, you know, there's there's been theories, of course, as to why that specific symmetry might lead to pairing, but I, I don't know if that's really the answer. There may be other lay-in parameters that are more important. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, let's see time for one last question. Uh, if we type away, type quickly. Okay, well, if not, uh, thanks very much for a fascinating talk. It gives us things to think about. Thank, Thank you. you.